It's my pleasure to welcome today's morning breakfast reflection speaker, Bill Baker. Bill has been a lifelong resident of Sioux Falls. He has the pride of the Patriots in his blood, as I found out, as a graduate of Lincoln High School. He's married to his beautiful wife, Peg, and has three children, of whom I'm sure he'll tell us more about. Uh, he's got a little night blood in him now, as his children are graduates of O'Gorman, and I was privileged uh, to teach all three. Bill received his degree from the University of South Dakota and the University of Michigan. He started work at the First National Bank in Sioux Falls in 1984 and is now the chairman and CEO. First National Bank has been a community bank in the area for over 131 years and owned principally by the Baker family since 1910. Please join me in welcoming Bill Baker. We'll be okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, Bishop Swain, Father Morgan, um, Joe and Brian, program leaders, all of you, uh, I'm, I'm humbled and honored to be here this morning uh, because as Father James P. Morgan can tell you from our days playing intramural football together down at the University of South Dakota on the bat machine, named after our favorite rum, I ain't no saint. <laughs> so it's, it's truly an honor to be here. Um, and Father, your, our memories of uh, those Bacardi days are safe with me because my memory of those days is pretty much non-existent. So. <laughs> um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to, I'd like to make this conversational, so as I mentioned to Joe, I'm going to try to detach and move around. I can get it, Joe. Detach and move around a little bit to the extent that uh, the cable will let me. Um, but I'd like to get out in front of the podium here and just encourage you all to stop and ask me questions because I could, I could just bore you to absolute tears. Uh, just ask me about Reg Z, Truth and Lending, or, uh, or uh, you know, Reg D, uh, uh, the uh, Funds Availability Act, and I can, I can go all day long. Uh, but um, it's great to be here this morning. Uh, I'm going to talk more or less in order about uh, uh, being a, a husband, uh, being a father, and then being a business person. Uh, my, my journey with my lovely wife uh, has a lot to do with my Catholic Formation, as I'll describe here a little later. But first, I tell you, I thought I'd uh, share a little show and tell here. So, um, this is a little story about being in family business. And uh, when I say family business, I'm talking about uh, businesses that are generational: uh, sons and daughters working for parents uh, or grandparents. Uh, but I'm also and with siblings and children. Uh, but I'm also talking uh, about uh, businesses that are uh, founded uh, and owned and operated by the people who work there every day. And I know uh, many of you here in the room fit into that category. So I think you'll understand a little bit of what I'm talking about. <clears throat> but um, family business for me means that the lines between family and business, and by extension even to community, get a little blurry at times. Uh, there aren't a lot of sharp distinctions in my life. I just uh, I more or less live life in, in, a, in a family world, whether I'm at work or at home, and uh, even out in the community. I just I, I feel that all the time. I feel that standing here this morning, and uh, I'm very blessed uh, to be able to have that feeling uh, throughout my life. Um, but um, this is, uh, you know, many of us, uh, if you work in a family business, you probably got started there when you were quite young, whether you really wanted to or not. Um, and for me, uh, my introduction came in the summer of 1975, uh, 41 years ago. I was 15 years old. I was at Lincoln High School. And uh, one summer, uh, the bank opened uh, the first drive-up banking facility in the state of South Dakota that featured pneumatically operated 
kiosk machines in the drive-up lanes. So this was uh, brand new technology back in the summer of 1975. And uh, most of you probably recognize this. This is the Model T of canisters here. <laughs> Uh, today they're clear and acrylic and lightweight. This thing weighs about five pounds, and it's a clunker. Um, but uh, I'll tell you a little bit about the story. So I'm at home doing what most high school kids do, sleeping in one weekday summer morning, and uh, uh, my mom gets a call, and she comes and urgently gets me out of bed and says, your dad's on the phone, Bill. And I got up, of course, and uh, answered the phone, and. Uh, my dad said, uh, who is a man of few words, he said, Bill, you got to get your butt down here. And then he hung up. I mean, that was, that was the extent of the conversation. And I knew enough to know that I better put a, a shirt, a nice shirt and tie and some nice slacks on. And I got in, my, uh, got in my old beater Ford and I drove down to the bank. And as soon as I uh, got down to the base of the um, viaduct at uh, 10th, and Phillips, I knew that uh, there was something going on because I came around the corner uh, <clears throat> there just to the southeast of the bank and, and the drive up uh, car line was out into the streets and uh, I could see both my dad and my uncle Bob, again this is a family business, uh, working pretty frantically in the drive up lanes and it, uh, as I got out of my car and uh, approached it became pretty clear that people were having a heck of a time with this newfangled technology. And uh, again, nobody had ever seen this in South Dakota, so they're pulling into those drive-up lanes, and uh, the way it works today, these things operate vertically, but back then they operated horizontally, and the door would flip open, and the uh, customer, the bank customer driving the car, would pull this thing out and look at it like it was something that absolutely came from another planet. I mean, <laughs> this was space-age technology. and. Uh, the instructions on how to use this thing are conveniently hidden inside. <laughs> so uh, we had most people literally during that first day or two pull that canister out of the kiosk machine, look at it for a few minutes, uh, you know, which caused long lines, needless to say, behind them, and then uh, about half of them would put it in the seat next to them uh, and drive off. So we, we were going through cases of these. And I got, and then, you know, after they had uh, put the canister in the seat next to them in the car, uh, they would pull out the uh, wallet or the checkbook or the deposit and the currency and coin and try to shove it down the tube. <clears throat> and so I got really good at taking these things and running them through the tubes to get all the currency, coin, deposit slips, everything that they were putting into the chutes out. And in the process of doing that, uh, the poor tellers who are working inside are getting a constant shower of pennies and nickels and quarters <laughs> because uh, young Bill Baker is out there running these things through the tubes to get the drive up cleared. And I learned some valuable lessons. I did that for about a month. Uh, because back in those days, uh, every bank customer was at the bank. There was no remote banking. Uh, it was even before ATMs. And uh, every customer had been at the bank, present at the bank, and through the learning process uh, with their paycheck or business deposit or whatever it was within a month. And so within 30 days, everyone had been educated and they understood the new technology and I learned the value of doing a little customer education when introducing a new technology into the market but more importantly I got a chance to meet just about every customer that banked with us downtown and uh, it was a wonderful first learning experience at the tender age of 15 down at the bank. Uh, again those of you who work in a family business a lot of you can probably really relate to that. But my, uh, my journey in my Catholic faith formation I uh, really didn't start until I was in college. I was uh, born and raised here in Sioux Falls, uh, and I grew up at Hope Lutheran Church, which is a, a little Lutheran church just about a half a block northeast of the corner of 26 and Cliff. Uh, my mom was uh, uh, religious, uh, faithfully uh, got me to, up and got me to church every Sunday morning with my two younger sisters. Uh, my dad was a Christian man, but he was not religious. And so it was mom and us three kids uh, going off to Hope Lutheran uh, every Sunday morning. And uh, that continued, thanks to my mother, 
through high school, and then uh, I went down to the University of South Dakota, and I joined the Lambda Chi Alpha Social Fraternity down there, which was a real blessing at that stage in my life. And uh, I soon discovered that on Sunday mornings, about the only guys in the fraternity house that were getting up and going to church were the Catholics. And I really didn't want to go to the Lutheran church by myself, so I started going along uh, with the Catholics to the Newman Center at the University of South Dakota. And Father James Michael Doyle was the pastor down there in 1978. And uh, uh, I just, uh, I got a chance to meet him, not only uh, through church at the Newman Center, but socially, because he was a, an activated faculty member of our fraternity and spent a fair amount of time there and really got to know and enjoy Father Doyle. And uh, so it wasn't long and I, it felt like family. I got very comfortable going to the Newman Center with my fraternity brothers and, uh, and continued to do that uh, through college. Uh, then the summer of my senior year, I was, uh, the summer before my junior year actually, I was working up uh, at a resort up in northern Minnesota. Uh, my family's been going up to northern Minnesota for years. Uh, but I was uh, working one evening in, in the, uh, I was at Grandview Lodge. Some of you are probably familiar with Gall Lake area. Uh, working in what was called the Totem Pole Lounge down in the basement. It's gone now. And I was the bartender and uh, I was holding down the fort as I had all spring. Uh, pretty much alone, uh, pouring the drinks and waiting the tables because it's just a little, a little hole in the wall bar. And uh, finally, Memorial Day came around, and uh, my boss, Mark Ryanai, who's uh, been the general manager of the resort now for 30 years, back in those days, he was an aspiring assistant manager, uh, noticed that uh, Bill is pretty busy and maybe needs a little help down there over the busy Memorial Day weekend. So he said, you know what, I'm going to ask my girlfriend if she'll come down and help you out. And she's working out in the pro shop during the day. I'd never met her. And so uh, the evening of Friday of Memorial Day 1980, uh, he brings uh, Mary Margaret Peg McGuire down to the Totem Pole Lounge and introduces me to my new cocktail waitress. And uh, for me, it was absolutely love at first sight. I was just completely smitten. And uh, for Peg, it was a much different story. <laughs> <laughs> and she can tell you about that sometime. But uh, my memories of that first night together, uh, prominent among those is... Uh, uh, Peggy had never cocktail, n never done anything, never, never probably had never had much to do with uh, an alcoholic beverage other than maybe a beer or two. And so I had to uh, give her a lot of instruction on the difference between uh, the uh, whiskey Coke and the gin and tonic. You know, one's clear and one's brown. And I'll put two straws in this one so you can tell them apart. And, uh, but she caught on very quickly. Uh, one of the things that is kind of a classic uh, first-time cocktail waitress mistake, back in those days a lot of people smoked and they would put their cigarettes in the ashtrays without necessarily putting them out and she's dumping these ashtrays into the garbage can along with a lot of cocktail napkins and other things and pretty soon we've got a fire going in the garbage can <laughs> her first night at work and uh, <clears throat> I'm tending the bar and the garbage can is over on her side next to the, next to the waitress station and I, I very coolly and calmly and confidently reach over with my soda gun and put the fire out in the garbage can. And I thought that was pretty cool. I'm not, I've never really asked Peg how she felt about that. But, um, but uh, I soon learned that uh, my friend, Peg, was Catholic. And uh, she and her family were regular attenders at St. Christopher's in Niswa, uh, very close just down the road from the resort. I was living on the resort. She was living with her family uh, at their lake home on Round Lake, just a few miles away. And so I started uh, tailing along again and uh, attending St. Christopher's on a regular basis on Sundays that summer. And uh, Peg and I became very good friends. And uh, um, she continued for a brief time to date the manager, but by the end of the summer we were spending a lot of time together and it hadn't uh, turned romantic at that point, but we both went back to school and she to the University of Iowa, I down to USD, and I got a call uh, uh, one October morning that fall, and here it was Peg inviting me to come up to Grandview. She was on uh, the short list of star employees who would get an invitation at the end of the summer to go to the summer closing party 
in October when they would uh, empty out all the coolers and and have a nice uh, fling up at Grandview before they closed everything down in those days. And she was inviting me to come up for this party. And uh, that, was, that was our first date, was the summer closing party at Grandview Lodge, fall of 1980. Uh, and it was just, uh, you know, falling in love from there. Uh, but um, we got married in, uh, a couple of years later in 1982, uh, right out of college. Um, both had just graduated. And then we went out to the University of Michigan where I went to graduate school, and uh, I had taken the RCIA classes, uh, and by that time was Father Emick, who was down at the University of South Dakota, and just wasn't quite ready uh, to cross over uh, at that time in, this, in my senior year, 1981 and 82. I uh, had a lot of the same reservations I'm sure a lot of young people have at that stage in life when they're thinking about it. And uh, I got out to the University of Michigan, and the pastor at the Newman Center there uh, gave me a couple of special uh, caseworkers. Uh, one was Sister Susan Kelly, who was a nuclear physicist at the University of Michigan. And the other one was Sister Eileen Green, who was on the writing faculty there at the law school at Michigan. And uh, believe me, the, uh, you know, they were formidable. And uh, whatever, whatever reservations I had, uh, they quickly overcame those. And so I went through IRCIA uh, my second year in graduate school and uh, became a Catholic in 1984. Um, Peg was my sponsor. And uh, one, of the, one of the things I remember uh, Sister Kelly, the nuclear physicist, saying to me as I relayed much the same story I've relayed to you is, Bill, do you think maybe you're being called? Well, that was a, yeah, maybe. Uh, just think about all of that through fraternity life at the University of South Dakota before we met and meeting my wife and uh, yeah, I was, I was being called. It was pretty clear. Um, and my Catholic faith today is uh, one of the, it is the greatest blessing in my life. It is a precious gift uh, and uh, I, I just can't tell you how fortunate I feel to have had the opportunity to be called in the way that I was as a young man. So today, uh, Peg and I, as Joe said, we have three children, all grown and out of the house now, all graduates of uh, O'Gorman High School in the Sioux Falls Catholic School System. Uh, oldest daughter, Maggie, is the only one here in Sioux Falls. She's uh, a lawyer um, in our trust department down at uh, the bank. Um, her younger sister, Lauren, uh, is a graduate of uh, O'Gorman uh, University of Nebraska and the Up With People program and uh, Mark and Jeannie, as we call them in our family, the Kanzimii, were uh, influential in leading her down that path, and it's been a wonderful blessing for her. Uh, she became a, a real world traveler, and uh, she's in her third year now of teaching in an uh, English immersion school, teaching art at, in uh, Chiang Rai, Thailand. Uh, just loves it. Um, Threw up with people, she met a young man uh, by the name of Danny Sanchez, who's from Queretaro, Mexico. Uh, they traveled together in uh, 1984, or excuse me, 2014. And um, uh, they became engaged last summer and are planning a September uh, wedding next fall at Leif Erikson, where our, all of our kids worked uh, throughout their uh, high school years and college years in the summer. So it's a near and dear place for Lauren. Um, it's getting a little bit complicated because uh, of Danny's uh, visa status as a Mexican citizen. Uh, he's here in the U.S. on a, uh, on a NAFTA visa. He is a um, Apple mobile application designer uh, with a firm in Denver, Colorado. Uh, so he's, uh, you know, he's, he's a degreed engineer. He's a wonderfully talented, brilliant, uh, just an incredible young man. Uh, Mark and his family have had a chance to get to know Danny a little bit. And we feel just incredibly blessed uh, that the two of them are engaged. But uh, figuring out now how they're going to get married and uh, uh, live, you know, as, as a couple is getting a little bit complicated. Um, so, and then our son Billy uh, graduated from O'Gorman in 2010. Um, and he's a musician. Uh, he fell in love with... Uh, with music uh, through people like Smitty, uh, Jim Smith at O'Gorman High School, and uh, Kathy Britton, and uh, he became a drummer 
uh, and he uh, has pursued that now as a career. He got a degree in drum set performance and in K through 12 music education at Berkeley College of Music in Boston. Uh, and then uh, spent a year in Minneapolis, uh, and he's making a living mostly teaching. He'd love to make a living playing the music, but that's challenging, as you all know. Uh, and then he moved out to L.A., uh, actually moved out there with a girlfriend. They've since broken up, and, uh, but he's living in Los Angeles. Uh, he's actually paying the rent. Uh, we've wound down the subsidy, and uh, I'm very proud of the fact that he's able to make a living now doing what he loves to do. But he's starting to think about uh, possibly graduate school and something a little different because I think he's realizing that it's, it's going to be a lifelong challenge for him to... Uh, make a living doing what he's doing, make a good living. Um, but uh, three wonderful, brilliant kids, and uh, we just love them all to death. And uh, this summer we welcomed our first grandchild, uh, Maggie and Kyle. Maggie's married to Kyle Grotlution, who's an associate of the Davenport Law Firm. Uh, they're both in their fourth year of career and living here in Sioux Falls. And this summer they, uh, they blessed our family with our first grandchild, Henry Garrett, or excuse me, Garrett Henry Grotlution and uh, he's the light of our lives. Uh, he's five months old now. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a good friend of mine, Steve Solly, when he found out that Peg and I were expecting our first grandchild, he said, uh, Bill, grandchildren are your reward for not killing your kids. <laughs> <laughs> and it's so true. Um, talk about the business a little bit and please again uh, ask me some questions because I know this is a, a businessman's fraternity uh, and I'm an open book I'm happy to answer uh, any question that I can other than questions about the bat machine down at the University of South Dakota but because uh, I can't remember the answers to those but um, uh, our family business uh, was chartered in Sioux Falls in 1885 uh, we celebrate 131 years this fall um, and uh, the history of the First National Bank and the history of the Sioux Falls community are intimately interwoven. Um, the bank was uh, founded by a group of pioneers led by Edwin A. Sherman. Um, and that Sherman name is familiar. He's the father of the Sioux Falls public park system. Uh, he donated 50 acres to become uh, Sherman Park and the Great Plains Zoo back in about 1910. Uh, he convinced his good friend Helen McKinnon to donate the land uh, south of the boulevard at 21st Street uh, to become McKinnon Park in Sioux Falls. Uh, he was a practicing attorney at that time, helped Helen McKinnon with her estate. I'm, I'm confident, although I don't know, that he probably had something to do with a gift to the Presentation Sisters, too, at the time to create the Avera McKinnon campus. He's somebody that uh, I'm very proud to call the founding father of the bank. Uh, my great-grandfather didn't come along until later. Uh, Edwin A. Sherman was, uh, I think, probably propelled aside. He was a little bit older. Uh, he had been born in 1844. Uh, he was propelled aside by a force of nature, a young man by the name of James Mead Bailey, uh, who came to Sioux Falls from Freeport, Freeport, Illinois. Bailey had been born in 1864. He was four years younger than my grandfather, my great-grandfather, uh, but he was a prodigy. Uh, he graduated from Rochester University at the age of 18 and then came to South Dakota. He had some family ties here. And uh, by the time he was 24, he was president of the bank, uh, probably the youngest bank president, national bank president in the country at the time, William Lafayette Baker who was originally from Nelson, New York, uh, near where they had gone to school together at Rochester, uh, to come out to Sioux Falls. Uh, my grandfather, as I said, was four years older. Um, and so they went to work together at the bank. It was just small potatoes at the time. It was located in one of the four uh, retail bays of the Beach Pay Building, which today is immediately next door south on the east side of Phillips Avenue of our building. It's where Orts Jewelers was for years and more recently um, uh, area code 605 running company is located there in the, the cupcake bakery I think most of you are probably familiar with it uh, they had one of the um, 22 foot storefront uh, retail bays in that building and that's where the bank was that was its only location they had uh, probably eight employees 
Um, and they were trying to successfully guide this thing through uh, the tumultuous times of the late 1800s, early 1900s. And uh, uh, W.L. was unattached. He was here. He was single. Uh, his family was all out in New York. I suspect that he had no real lifelong intentions of staying in Sioux Falls. Um, but uh, about two years after he came out to work here in 1889, his friend Bailey dies. Um, he had been stepped on and had his foot crushed by a horse and uh, a gangrene infection set in and those days people died from those things. And so uh, this thing just kind of lands in his lap uh, and it, to me it's a little bit ironic that uh, his friend was uh, Bailey and, and if you think about the mov movie It's a Wonderful Life, George Bailey's father dies and a bank kind of lands in his lap. Uh, and I think there are a lot of parallels there but uh, William Lafayette uh, worked then for a group of uh, a succession of uh, board members uh, who were officially the presidents of the bank. He was still a young man too. And I think maybe after the first experience, they weren't quite ready to turn the reins completely over to a, a man still in his 20s. But uh, prominent, and, and these were uh, interestingly, almost all of them, about four or five of them were returning Union Army Civil War veterans to Sioux Falls. One prominent one was a gentleman by the name of Porter Peck, who was uh, one of the first mayors of the city of Sioux Falls. Um, but by about 1910, W.L. Baker uh, became president of the bank, and uh, uh, he and his wife Sarah, uh, he got married uh, a little bit later in life. They had five children, four of whom survived. Again, uh, that was not uncommon in those days. And uh, only one surviving son was my father, William Wiswall Baker. And back in those days, you married your daughters well, and your husband or your sons in inherited the family wealth. And uh, so my grandfather, William Wiswall, uh, took over in about 1939 and continued to guide the bank for some 30 years until he had debilita a debilitating stroke in about 1969. And then my dad took over. Uh, in about 69 or 70, and he retired in 1995, and, and uh, he's been gone for six years, but that's when I took over, and here I am today. So it's been a family business now for over 100 years. Uh, incredibly blessed uh, by so many things, but uh, more than anything else, incredibly blessed to be here in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, because as a community bank, our fortunes are inextricably tied to the prosperity of this community. and. Uh, it's been, believe me, it's been a great place to do business for over a century. It's just, we are all so blessed here in Sioux Falls. It's an amazing place. So that's, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Uh, I think I've got a few minutes for a few questions. And again, I'd, I'd love an opportunity to answer anything you'd like. Yeah, must, Paul. Yeah, it was. Uh, Yes, and again, I'm happy to talk about anything. Uh, I've got, uh, we've got four, uh, or three actually, uh, fourth generation family members that work at the bank. I'm the oldest by 14 years, but I've got two younger cousins, uh, Stephanie Gangopoulos um, and Bob Baker, who are both ac uh, very actively employed there. Uh, Stephanie is um, our executive vice president of cultural development. And uh, you know, I, I I hesitated momentarily to bring this booklet today um, because it looks a little bit like an advertisement, so I'm not going to talk about it. But this, this is our mission and values. Uh, these are the corporate values, the corporate culture of the First National Bank in Sioux Falls. We call it the First National Way. And it talks about our constitution, our, the way we do business, and the culture we've tried to instill at the bank. Stephanie is the principal author of this. She is the keeper of our culture. Uh, and she's uh, just does a brilliant job. She's very quiet, as uh, uh, some of you who know Stephanie would know, uh, but she's extremely effective in the background in uh, developing and cultivating uh, things like these values that really have guided the organization, as the booklet says, for generations, because it's just codifying those values that have, have led, it, led us all along. Her uh, brother, Bob, both her first cousins of mine, uh, is the team leader of our business banking group down at the bank, so he's got an important role too. They're both in very important roles. Uh, but uh, when it came down to it, um, 
neither one of them uh, really was prepared to uh, you know, step up and become the president. That's not to say that they might not be someday because as I said, they're quite a bit younger. They're half a generation younger than I am. Uh, my dad was uh, the much older brother of three sons of my grandfather, W.W. W. and his wife, Helen. And so, um, uh, you know, we've got a half a, dist half a generation between my dad and his brothers and now between myself and my cousins. Uh, so we, uh, I, selected Christopher Ekstrom, Chris Ekstrom, who I'm sure uh, a lot of you know, who's an incredible, he's a young man from, I say, I say young, he's uh, in his late 40s, but he's, uh, you'd think he was still in high school if you, if you met Chris. Uh, uh, from a banking family in Phillips, South Dakota, uh, he's a West River kid, West River Ranch kid, and uh, just incredible values. Uh, he's extremely, he's been working for the bank for nearly 25 years. He's extremely well connected in the community. He's got a great network of uh, friends and acquaintances. He's a proven, very talented manager and leader of the organization. He's had a senior executive role there for a long time, and so he emerged really as the natural the logical choice to be my successor, but Paul's absolutely right. He's the first non-baker to lead the organization in over 100 years, so um, kind of a, a daunting proposition for both of us. Uh, I'm planning to continue to work there uh, for at least the next three years. I'd like to get to age 60 uh, before I really dial down, and uh, I love what I do. I love getting up and going to work every day, but being a fourth generation family business leader, uh, you know, you, you have good models. My dad was a great model, my uncle was a great model. And, uh, you know, I, I learned the importance of good succession planning and uh, uh, really uh, making sure that the future generations are in good hands. So Chris is gonna be running the organization and he's, it, it's in very capable hands. Another question? Yeah, Mark. Bill, you, you uh, expressed your gratitude for your Catholic faith. Yes. How do you, how do you live that Catholic faith in every day in the business practice? How do you do that in a, here in a community bank that represents all types of backgrounds and faith and traditions? Yeah, a uh, great question. And and uh, you know the best answer I can give you is probably in that book, but it you know it speaks in terms of uh, you know um, how we how we build relationships and how we interact with the people in the community and just uh, trying to be people of integrity and uh, you know we're not an overtly religious organization obviously and we do have uh, uh, you know faith even in, within our family but uh, we all uh, believe strongly and adhere to principles and values that uh, were handed down to us by our parents and uh, you know it's, it certainly has served us well for a long time. Yeah. Bill, will you be able to answer the question that the nun asked you back in Michigan? <laughs> Can you answer that question? Absolutely. I, yeah, I was being called. It's, you know, you look at those experiences in your life in the rearview mirror and you realize it actually it nearly took a two by four upside the head to get, to get me to realize that, but there was no doubt in my mind. As I said, I was up against some pretty formidable counselors there. Troy? something that you appreciate in the church that we might take for granted and that or maybe Peg takes for granted that you identify as valuable? Um, probably, you know, I could, I could list a number of things. So, but, so I'll just mention maybe one or two that come to mind. But, you know, I'm obviously I'm a lover of history and tradition and uh, uh, ritual and uh, all that just uh, really speaks to me. And I know it's much more than just ritual and tradition and history. Uh, but, uh, you know, that, that to me uh, is, is uh, something that I truly love about uh, my Catholic faith. And it's, I find it so deeply comforting, uh, you know, at challenging times in my life, and we all have them. Um, but uh, I, go, I go immediately to my faith, and it's just going home every time. That's what it is for me. Uh, it's like family. Um, uh, you know that would that would certainly be at the top of the list, I think. And you know, if you grew up in that, you don't really probably realize the difference between that and uh, and and a, a Protestant religion, for example. Yeah. 
All right. Well, thank you all so much. Appreciate it.